All right. Well, thank you very much, Catapult, for the invitation. It's always great. Um, the turnover is always amazing. So even though I cannot see you and it sounds like a monologue, um, I know you guys are out there, you know, on a Wednesday afternoon. So you go figure. So today, um, <clears throat> our topic is related to adhesive dentistry. And adhesive dentistry is pretty much what we do every day, sort of bread and butter. Um, and, you know, I wish I could see you to ask the two questions I ask the most um, whenever I lecture anywhere, anywhere in the world. And the first question is, raise your hand, those of you guys who do, you know, posterior composite. Everybody raises their hand. And then, of course, second question is raise the patient comes back the next day with sensitivity. Same people that raise their hands, keep their hands up. So even though there has been an improvement in technology and in product development, there's, there are still issues. So let's talk about those today and see how we can tackle post-op sensitivity, you know, once and for all. Right, so it's a little, uh, now a little bit about myself. There is a picture of my face right there. I'm Venezuelan born and I got my DDS um, down in Venezuela. Um, I do have a master's of science in biomaterials University of Alabama in Birmingham and um, I am a member of the IADR. I've been a member of the IADR for a long time since 2001. I have published in those meetings many 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 times uh, via oral presentations and or posters that is the association that hits home and i am very involved in that and right now i am currently the manager of clinical research at bisco incorporated um i did practice dentistry from 1995 until 2014 so i took a little time off in order to attend my biomaterials program here in the states and now i am full-time with bisco inc um, but I did practice for a long time, so, you know, it's kind of like nobody told me I lived it. So hopefully you guys uh, will appreciate a little bit of the experience that I want to share with you guys. Um, this is just bragging rights. I take it everywhere. I run marathons. So Chicago, London, Berlin, Tokyo, New York. I run all of that. And next year I'll run Boston and I'll be one of those 5,000 people that have run all six major marathons. This is basically what I'm doing now, trying to get that Ironman medal. I already got the half one, so the full one is next. It's just a little something, something to tell people, you know, set a goal, go get it. You know, my family tells me that I'm an overachiever, but it is what it is. Adhesive dentistry requires common sense, guys. Common sense. It doesn't require to be a, you know, to have a massive background in chemistry or to understand covalent bonding or, you know, collagen fiber interaction with the resin. It requires common sense. There are two things that you need to know, that you need to do in order to achieve proper bonding. The first one is mechanical retention to whatever surface. It could be enamel, dentin, zirconia, lithium disilicate, metal. It doesn't matter. You need to achieve mechanical retention. The second thing is some kind of chemical interaction. Okay, the application of some kind of primer that will generate some chemical bond to the surface. Again, primers differ. There isn't one primer that will work for all surfaces, or at least not yet. Um, you know, but um you need some kind of primer you need mechanical retention and you need a primer in the past um and this of course depends on how long have you been practicing dentistry in the past or at least when i went to dental school you know in the late 80s you know um i was told that enamel that um etching dentin with phosphoric acid was a no-no because it will kill the pulp and we were supposed to only etch enamel. So, you know, we had to protect the dentin with some sort of base or liner 
uh, the sandwich technique, which was calcium hydroxide and then glass cyanomer or resin modified glass cyanomer, and then you etch the enamel and place your composite. And that worked for a long time, you know? And, and, and if you think about it, I mean, I think about restorations that I place using that technique for a long time. And I remember when I set up my office, a lot of the patients that I treated while I was a student came to my office and those restorations lasted a long time. Um, then the whole total etch technique concept came about and we were told that we could, that we were able to etch dentin and achieve great bond. But then we started having issues. And the biggest issue was post-up sensitivity. At least I encountered that. And the reason why I encounter that is that if you look at the total edge concept, you have to apply your etchant on both enamel and dentin. You know, um, etching time will vary depending on the surface, but I want to say, you know, anywhere between 10 to 15 seconds is more than plenty on dentin and at least 20 seconds on enamel you should be able to achieve a, you know, a good uh, conditioning of the surface um, in order to place your bonding agent on top of it. When you etch dentin, the primary reason to etch dentin, and this was described by Professor Fusayama, you know, he's the one who basically developed the total etch concept in Japan, University of Tokyo. Um, he said that the reason you etch is to remove the smear layer. And that is true, phosphoric acid will remove the smear layer, but um, and it will open up the dentinal tubules. It will open up dentinal tubules. This picture over here is a scanning electron microscopy of etched dentin. And you can see all the tubules that are wide open. And then in the lower part right here, I'm using my cursor here, hopefully you guys can see this. You can see uh, tubules that are, you know, they have something in it, you know, they have something like plugged in it. That's smear layer. So you have here etched dentin and you have down here unetched dentin. Phosphoric acid removes the smear layer and opens up the tubules. And also, because you're demineralizing the dentin, etching it, you are removing the organic component of dentin, which is hydroxyapatite, and you're leaving behind the in the organic component. So you're removing inorganic component, hydroxyapatite, and leaving organic component, which is collagen. And collagen has to be protected. Collagen is very frail. So imagine like, you know, a bunch of spaghetti. That's, that is what collagen looks like when you etch it. Looks like spaghetti, right? And it's very frail. Now, the idea of having collagen exposed is a consequence of your etching procedure, but now you have to think about that you have to cover this collagen and basically embed it in resin, which is containing your adhesive. And when you do this properly, the adhesive will penetrate through the collagen network and then also penetrate into the dentinal tubules. And when you accomplish that, that process is called hybridization. You're generating a hybrid layer, and then you're sealing the tubules properly, and you're bonding. And great, it works, absolutely. No one can say that this technique does not work. However, what happens sometimes is that some of those tubules are not properly sealed. And if you don't seal the tubules properly, there's going to be sensitivity. How does that happen? Well, there is a, um, an article uh, written by Professor Martin Brandstrom uh, in the early 80s, uh, published in the Journal of um, Scandinavian Endodontics. In 1981, and, and the article's title is uh, "The Theory of uh, the Hydrodynamic Theory of Dentin Sensitivity." I will leave my email at the end of uh, the, the the webinar, and you guys can write to me for any reference that I mention here, and I will be more than happy to share that with you. But you can look it up on Google. 
Um, I think that article is probably a public domain. You don't have to, you know, try to pay for it or something. And that article talks about how inside the dentinal tubule there is a, a odontoblastic prolongation, in which is basically swimming in dentinal uh, fluid. And whenever there is some kind of stimulus, could be a change in pH, change in pressure or temperature, that stimulus is going to basically hit that prolongation and it will travel all the way to the odontoblast. And the odontoblast is located at the periphery of the pulp and the reaction will be pain. So not sealing these dentinal tubules properly, which happens from time to time. And you, hide, you guys have to think about what you do. You know, if some of you guys say, well, I never got any sensitivity. And then I'm like, okay, you know, God bless the way you're doing things. But a lot of you guys that are listening to this, you have to think about, well, I do get sensitivity every now and then. And one of the reasons could be, you know, on proper sealing of the dentinal tubules. So there are ways of sealing tubules properly whenever you do this technique. Now, you have to think about collagen and you have to think about that layer being kind of like a sponge, you know, ready to absorb whatever you put on top of it. So if you think about a dry sponge, or if you think about a kind of like a moist sponge, you know, when the sponge is dry, it doesn't absorb very well. It's kind of stiff and it's, you know, it, it, it's not very good, but you know, you take the sponge and you put a little bit of water in it and now the sponge can absorb even more. So think of dentin kind of like a sponge, you know, collagen kind of like a sponge. So whenever you etch and remove the etch and you rinse it, let's try to avoid using air, using air to remove excess water, okay? We need to remove the excess water, you know, pooled water, but we need to leave the dentin visibly moist. Most adhesives use some kind of solvent that can be either ethanol or it can be acetone. And those two solvents like water, they are water chasers. But, so you need to leave that bit moist. Nevertheless, if you use air, what's gonna happen is that that air is going to collapse the collagen. So right here, this is an SCM of collagen that is moist and after two or three seconds of air what you're going to have is a collapsed collagen now if i go back and you look at this surface this surface is ready to absorb it's moist it's ready to absorb that adhesive and the adhesive will penetrate through that network and then it will go into the dentinal tubules sealing them which is what you want to accomplish. But when you collapse collagen with air, the adhesive, what's gonna happen is going to crash, you know, just hit that collagen collapse wall. And it's gonna be a little bit more difficult for the adhesive to properly go through that, you know, collapse collagen wall and then seal the dentinal tubules. So this is a optimum, this is an optimum situation this is not so optimal. So first of all, you want to avoid using air. Now, you might think, well, how do I remove the excess without air? Well, there are a lot of methods out there. Some people use foam pellets, cotton pellets. Some people use, you know, paper, absorbing paper. I've even heard people talk about coffee filters, you know, whatever. I particularly um, used for many years high back suction. HIVAC has proven to remove excess moisture but not to desiccate the dentin, leaving what I like to call proper moisture conditions for bonding after etching with phosphoric acid. So you take your HIVAC, stick it in there, remove the excess moisture, make sure there are no you know, any nooks, any corners with any pooled water. That's just, this is something that visually you're going to have to assess. And then once you see a visibly moist surface, you know, shiny without any pulling water, and then you apply your adhesive. And you are going to increase your success 
you know, you are going to probably diminish post-op sensitivity occurrence. And this is very important. This is a key point right here. Everybody etches pretty much the same amount of time. Everybody rinses pretty much the same amount of time. But when it comes down to controlling moisture, this is where everybody has a different opinion, a different protocol. I heard this guy do this. I heard that other guy do that. There is no true uh, consensus on how, how to obtain a visibly moist surface. What there is a consensus is, is that you need to leave the dentin moist. How you achieve that? That's a different story. And I will recommend to you guys, use HiVac. HiVac will definitely help you. Everybody has HiVac in their office. That's for sure. So just use it. And that way, you will be able to achieve proper, a visibly moist dentin and then place that adhesive. And that's going to work really well for you. OK? Now, there are issues with total edge. Again, I'm not saying total edge is not a good technique, but there are limitations. The technique is sensitive. OK? Why? Because you're exposing collagen. Now you have to treat a very sensitive um, surface, OK? The whole concept of how wet is wet, it's very, very difficult to grasp, you know, exactly how does it need to look. And this is something you learn over time. So maybe for the most, uh, for the more seasoned clinician, they already get it. For, but for the new guy, it's a little bit more difficult. How wet is wet is a concept that is very abstract. And in my mind, it's very subjective. You know, it all depends on the way you see things, okay? There is, well, not so much anymore, but there is a, depending on the solvent, things can work a little better. I think ethanol, if you're gonna choose an adhesive, you should use something that is ethanol based that is always more forgiving on the level of moisture. Acetone works great, but it's more sensitive to moisture than ethanol. And then of course you have the issues with post op sensitivity. This, is, this happens because you open up the tubules. It, it, it is part of the technique. You're not etching to opening up the tubules, you're etching to remove the smear layer. But opening up the tubules and exposing collagen is a consequence of that procedure. So you have to think about that. Because of that, in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, we had a self-etch concept come about. And self-etch materials, um, other than clear and bond, they were all not very good. Clear fill and bond is from Curare. It's a very, very good product. It's a product that worked really well. It had limitations on enamel. It didn't etch enamel very well, but it did bond very well to dentin. It sealed the dentin without the need to use a phosphoric acid. It was a two bottle system. I, I am not being sponsored by Curare, but I have to, you know, give them kudos because they opened the door to a whole new possibilities of research and development by introducing a this product that contained MDP. That's basically it. Their, phos, their organophosphate adhesive promoting monomer was something that was very good. It is very good, very stable, and it's a very good adhesive inducing monomer. Okay, so it came out, but because Corare had a patent on that product, on that monomer, everybody else was trying to do the same in order to compete, and it was just awful. Self-edge was unstable. You got to see a lot of ditching on enamel. You got to see a lot of, you know, staining on the enamel uh, and, and restoration interface. Things were falling off. It was just not very good. So mostly of the problems were on enamel. On dentin, things were fine, at least from a bonding perspective, immediate bonding. But the degradation, the amount of water con, this just was just awful. Okay, so sensitivity disappeared to some extent, but your bonding, you took a, a, too many steps back when it came down to bonding. Now, enamel bonding has been tested and proven for many, many years since Buono Cuore. You know, you etch enamel, you're going to achieve that micromechanical retention that is needed, and things are going to cling on to it. You know, when you, if you cement a veneer and you etch enamel, 
It doesn't matter what the prep looks like. That thing is going to stay. So enamel bonding is very predictable. It's very strong. Okay, dentin bonding is not very predictable. It is strong, but it can degrade over time. So now we have a product that it's failing in the most important where you need it the most, which is enamel bonding. So self-fetch didn't quite work very well. Nevertheless, the concept of self-fetch was very good, is very good. Okay, so in my mind, I was doing research already working in labs in the early 2000s. So in my mind was like, how can we make self-fetch better? Not to dismiss or be dismissive of the concept, but how do we make self-fetch better? And this is what drives my research and, 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 and this is what drives me as a, as a researcher and as someone who's involved in clinical research. How do we make protocols better? How do we make better products? How do we make better techniques? How do we make dentistry better? So in my mind, how do we make self-fetch better? Is it possible? And then, you know, lo and behold, yes. The first thing that, you know, everybody thought about was, well, you need the best of both worlds. You need something that will keep you from having sensitivity. So self-fetch is not generating sensitivity, but also you need a way to bond well to enamel. And now you got a little something going on. Why doesn't self-fetch generate sensitivity? Because you're not opening up the dental tubules. You are not removing the smear layer. You are altering the smear layer with, with a self-fetch process. You are placing your self-fetch material on top of the dentin, which contains the smear layer, and you're either dissolving the smear layer by not rinsing it away, or you're incorporating the smear layer to your bonding um, to your bonding interface. And that's basically what it, what self-fetch does. But on enamel is a different story. So this is the technique that I probably recommend the most. It doesn't necessarily mean that total edge doesn't work or self-fetch doesn't work. With self-edge, you got issues with enamel bonding. With total edge, you, you have more issues with sensitivity. Some of you are going to, uh, you know, are probably thinking right now, okay, this guy is telling me that I have issues. I don't have any issues with my total edge technique, and that's fine. You keep on doing what you're doing, and God bless. You know, not a problem. However, some of you are right now thinking, well, I do have a couple of issues here and there. You know, I have more issues or, yeah, I get that patient with sensitivity once or twice a week. Well, selective vetch will definitely help you um, with avoiding the sensitivity due to bonding because you're not etching dentin you're with phosphoric acid. You are not, you know, generating all this you know, opening up any dentinal tubules, you're not exposing any collagen, you're just basically etching the enamel and you are cell, with phosphoric acid and you are self etching the adhesive, the, the dentin with an adhesive that will not expose the dentinal tubules, expose the collagen, thus will not generate post-op sensitivity. Now, a lot of people ask me, Rolando, you are going to, you know, unavoidably etch dentin when you do selective etch. Yes, that is true, but you're not going to etch the whole dentin surface. You might etch a little bit on the, you know, at, on, on the DJ, you know, you know, of course here in this box, you're gonna etch some. I'm not saying you're not going to etch. Yes, you, will probably etch a little bit here and there, but it's not like you're etching the, the whole surface. The biggest issue with etching dentin with phosphoric acid is keeping dentin moist, keeping collagen from collapsing and being able to seal the most amount of dentin nutribles possible. So in order to avoid all of that, what I wanna do is how do I bond without having to etch dentin with phosphoric acid. And don't get me wrong, people always think of, like when I talk about selective etch, they think that I'm only etching enamel and not etching dentin. That is not right. I'm etching both, but I'm etching dent enamel with phosphoric acid. 
I'm etching dentin with self-etch adhesive or a universal bonding agent, which is what I usually recommend. So I think universal bonding agents are just fantastic and they will work in this bonding technique, selective etch mode. Now, if you still want to etch dentin and use your total etch system, you can do that. If you want to etch dentin and enamel and you want to change to a universal bonding agent, you can do that because universal bonding agents are versatile enough in, uh, that they will work on both total edge and self edge techniques. Not a problem. So that's really cool. That's something that these new bonding agents, they have this ability. So, you know, I'm not going to recommend to use a universal bonding agent, but I will recommend that if you're doing selective edge, to use a universal bonding agent. Because if you accidentally etch dentin, your bonding agent will work on both etched dentin and unetched dentin without any problems. Okay. If you on a, you know if you by mistake etch dentin and use a self etch that is not properly designed to work on etch dentin, you might have sensitivity. So if you want to run with this technique, selective etch, etch your enamel for 20 seconds, rinse, and then apply your select your um, universal bonding agent on both enamel and dentin, and then I would recommend a universal bonding agent. That is something that it, it, it fits the technique much, much better. Um, usually people ask me, which one should I use? Well, you know, I work for a company, so of course I'm going to recommend you the one that uh, we manufacture, Auburn Universal. But that shouldn't be the question. The question is, I have this bonding agent. Can I use it with selective edge technique? And then I will definitely provide you with an answer to that. Because in, in, in the ultimate goal, even though for, for, for us who are in, in the industry, this is a business, the ultimate goal in my mind is to provide support to clinicians to perform um procedures better to perform procedures in a more um predictable way and to provide them with information that will help them do better dentistry and that's basically what i like to do and that's why i'm always every time uh, they invite me to one of these webinars i say yes because it's another opportunity to share a little bit of the stuff that you know we gather from the lab and also from my personal experience so when you think about total edge, you're doing a bunch of stuff, you know, and you have to think about a bunch of stuff. Um, one of the things you have to think about is collagen exposure. We already went through that. Opening dental and tubules, we already went through that. And then of course, the activation of MMPs. MMPs, they're not going to generate, they're not going to generate um, post-op sensitivity, okay? But they are activated. What are MMPs? Matrix metalloproteinase. They love collagen. They are enzymes that love collagen. They will eat up the collagen over time. Once you hit them with a low pH product or you generate a low pH environment, and this is something that you do when you're etching with phosphoric acid, these enzymes are activated and they will start to eat the collagen away over time. It, it's not going to happen immediately, but it will happen over time. So you need to deactivate the, the, um, the enzymatic activity. You need to deactivate it. And you can deactivate it two ways or three ways. First way to do this is to, after you etch, you apply chlorhexidine, you know, 2% diglucan chlorhexidine, and you leave it there for 20 seconds. Use it like a moisturizing agent you know, um, you know, like uh, you're like re-wetting the surface. Leave it there for 20 seconds. Don't rinse it and then apply your adhesive, okay? That's one way. Second way is to use an etchant that contains BAC or benzoclonin chloride. And the benzoclonin chloride will deactivate the MMPs. So you're not only etching and kind of cleaning the surface, you're also deactivating MMPs, all at the same time. So a, a 
BAC containing etchen is an interesting idea. And the other way to avoid this or to deactivate MMPs is by not activating MMPs, by not etching the dentin with phosphoric acid. That is the way to deal with MMPs, okay? So when I look at um, ways to, you know, protocol, from a protocol point of view, what is my full recommendation, you know? And, and my first recommendation is always the same. It doesn't matter where I'm standing. I always tell people, look, you don't need to etch dentin with phosphoric acid. Not anymore. You're not going to get better bond. You're not going to have more predictable bond. You're going to get yourself in, you might get yourself into trouble. You don't need to edge that deep dentin. You don't need to edge superficial dentin either. With universal bonding agents, you're achieving pretty solid and consistent bond strength on dentin. Okay. However, what I'm going to say here, uh, I, you know, some people may disagree and that's fine. Um, when it comes to bonding to dentin, you know, the deeper you go, the less you're able, able to bond predictably. And this is because of the amount and configuration of the internal tubules, the amount of water, the, you know, closer to the pulp, your, your bond strength goes down. Um, you know, the, 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 the dentinal tubule pressure, we have so many variables. Also, you have deep dentin, esclerotic dentin, protective dentin, carious infected dentin, carious affected dentin, all these different dentins, axial dentin, um, you know, occlusal dentin, cervical dentin, you know, all these different surfaces because they are different and you're trying to bond to each one of them with one product. It's not that simple and it's not that reliable. It does work, but it is kind of, because there's so many variations, it, it, it is kind of difficult. Enamel, on the other hand, is very predictable, and it's very easy to bond to, proven over decades of research. It's, it, it's something that no one dares to discuss. There is no reason to find a better way to bond to enamel. We already have a pretty good way to bond to enamel. Etch it with phosphoric acid for 20 seconds, and now you got something. Dentin is a different story. So I always tell people, protect the dentin. Protect it. Especially if you're going deep, protect it. Don't worry too much about bonding to the dentin. Worry about protecting the dentin, at least in those deep areas. Apply some kind of liner, you know, if you're too deep into the prep, you may want to use something like a, a, an indirect, uh, indirect pulp capping agent, you know, indirect pulp protection. If you're not so deep and then you apply a liner, you know, you, you have to think about protecting the dentin, okay? And using a liner, in my mind, is a good thing. I'm not saying you have to think about starting, you know, start to place dical. Not necessarily. Dical had its moments, and resin modified glass and enamel had had its moments. But there are better products out there today that you can use. You know that will avoid post op sensitivity. Why? Because they behave like insulating agents. When you think about those of you who are old enough or seasoned enough that placed amalgams. Um, you never got a patient with an amalgam that came back the next day because he had post-op sensitivity. That didn't happen. That did not happen. And the reason, unless the, um, the restoration was high and then you had a sensitivity due to occlusion, but not related to dentin sensitivity. And the reason for that is because, you know, we applied varnishes that protected the dentin and also some kind of base, whether it was glass ionomer, zinc phosphate, polycopic silic cement, something, you know, glass ionomer, dicalin glass ionomer, we applied something to protect that dentin and then the amalgam, insulating agent, protecting, you know, against, you know, the pressure and changes in temperature and changes in pH and, and it worked fine. So if you take that concept that worked, 
uh, protecting the dentin, and you have, it, 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 and if you try to apply it to composite to adhesive dentistry, I think that that actually makes a lot of sense. So in my mind, protecting the dentin with a liner is something that is good and it should be done in order to prevent post-op sensitivity. Okay, so apply a liner. There are many new liners out there. This is one of them. This is another one of them. This is another one. And of course, this is another one. All right, you can choose whatever you want. It doesn't matter, but use something. If you're deep into that preparation, use something to protect that dentin. Don't think about bonding to dentin all the time. It is okay to apply a liner. And then you bond to the remaining walls and you bond to enamel, which is more predictable. But protect the dentin. And that way, you will do a service, especially with these new, you know, the theracals and the biodentines that actually release calcium, generating an alkali pH and all of that. Those products are really, you know, interesting to use prior to placing your composite. You're doing a better service and you're still bonding and you will not get into any sort of sensitivity issue when you use these products. These products are really, really cool. And what they're even talking about now is that these products help remineralize the dentin surface. That dentin that has been, and you can see here, this is a, a study by Professor Sauro from Spain. And he is showing how these calcium silicate containing products are remineralizing the dentin at different degrees of the remineralization different types of remineralization, but you don't see that with glass ionomers or with other or dental adhesive. You're seeing that with these calcium silica containing products. And that is something that actually um, provide, at least to me, it gives me this, um, uh, how do I say it? This horizon, a new horizon for research and for development, you know, so protecting the dentin, is something that is going to help you avoid sensitivity. And how do you protect it? Use a liner, use a liner, okay? That is something that is definitely gonna help you um, achieve the goal of no post-op sensitivity. Will I use a liner here? Absolutely. That's deep dentin, right there, deep dentin, okay? Right there, right here, I will definitely use a liner. You have this case by Dr. Elvio Durano from Argentina, he's a dear friend. And he shows me this, you know, dical and all that soft tissue. And he just removes all of that, right, with an excavator. And now one of the things he's doing, and a lot of people are doing this all over Europe at least, and some in the States, they're using this product called AquaCare, which is a, it's a sandblaster that works with water. Um, that's, an, uh, the, that's the version made in the UK. There's one in the US called PrepSmart. It's been around for a while but it's gaining popularity again. So basically what you could do is remove that dentin, use this device to help you remove that dentin. I mean, this is pulsing right here. And what he has left is carries affected dentin. So is he gonna try to bond to this? Why? Why? It's protected. And then you can bond to the surrounding surface, to the surrounding area without any issue, selective edge. And of course, he's going to etch the dentin, even if he didn't want to. And there you have it. There is a little bit of dehydration here. You know, he can solve that by rehydrating a little bit of that dentin. And then he applies his, his adhesive. But he protected, did some selective edge, and then of course, place his adhesive. And that is going to work very well all the time. And I think this is the way we should um, approach um, these deep preps with a lot of respect to the dentin by applying some kind of liner. And of course, by not etching the dentin with phosphoric acid. Okay, that is um, what I think should be done. This is another case, not so critical as, you know, as the one we just saw. This is Dr. Angel Castro from Nicaragua, also a dear friend. And um, all these guys have gone to my lectures or to my C programs that I do all over the world. And of course, look at this dentin here and look at this deep dentin. You know, it's like, oh, let's bond. Bond to what? That stuff is so 
nasty. You can't vaunt to that. That's hard deadened. It's like over calcified. So what do you do? Just protect it. And then bond to the surrounding surface, to the dentin on the wall, and to the enamel. Okay? And there you have it. There's your composite. It's not the best looking composite, but it does the work. And I think it's really interesting. So that's the approach. You know, the approach should be, if you're going to edge with phosphoric acid, make sure, uh, dentin, you know, that's where sensitivity comes from. You have to be careful with collagen fibers exposure. You have to make sure you maintain the proper moisture. Use a high back in order to avoid desiccation by using air. Use high back, okay? And properly use your dental adhesive to make sure you seal all dental tubules. Use center in deep preps. That will definitely avoid sensitivity. And what I think is the most interesting um, concept of all, if you're doing total edge, give selective edge an opportunity. Give selective edge an opportunity because selective edge is a little bit more predictable. Nowadays, universal bonding agents bond very well to dentin without the need of etching with phosphoric acid, okay? And you can bond to enamel by etching with phosphoric acid and you're gonna have one hell of a restoration from a bonding perspective. And the last thing, apply a liner. Calcium silicate containing liner. Calcium silicate, MTA, something like that. Forget about calcium hydroxide, um, but apply a liner. If you apply your Theracal or your Biodentine, and then you apply a, a glass enamel on top of that, be my guest. But whatever is in contact with the dentin has to be some sort of calcium releasing product in order to generate that alkaline pH and to protect the dentin. Okay, protecting the dentin is the most important thing in order to avoid sensitivity. It's not some kind of doohickey device, it's not some kind of technique, it's just a thought process. Protect the dent. Okay, this is my email, rnunes at bisco.com. Again, my name is Rolando Nunez. Um, I will answer um, some questions that I'm getting right here, right now. Okay, I get, Dr. Nunez, would you recommend selective etching when bonding crowns as well to avoid post up sensitivity? Emacs crowns, for example. Yes, etching the dentin with phosphoric acid. This is from Dr. Nino Sinsatse. Um, etching dentin, especially in a crown prep, that's deep dentin. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. So selective edge will definitely do the trick and use a MDP containing, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, universal adhesive engine. Greetings from Cusco, Peru, Flor. Greetings from Cusco. Uh, second question, do you recommend using Gluma the sensitizing agent? No, I do not recommend using Gluma because I stopped etching dentin a long time ago. If Gluma works for you, that's fine. Um, Gluma is a little nasty on soft tissue. You gotta be careful, but it does work. Um, it works um, because you are trying to desensitize something that, it's kind of like trying to make up for a mistake that you did on purpose. Oh, I got Gluma so I can etch. Well, why don't you stop by, start by not etching and then you don't need to use Gluma. How does the sensitizers like uh, Gluma or Hema work? Well, they work by, Gluma works by fixating collagen and Hema works by um, reweighting the, uh, the collagen fiber structure, the dentin, in kind of like a primer. So you have a better wet surface to work with. Again, if you don't etch the dentin, you don't have to worry about any of it. What are your thoughts on using Gluma? Wow, Gluma again already answered. Can you recommend a few universal bonding agents? Yes, I can recommend to you that, um, of course, are uh, all bond universal from Bisco. That's a, that, that, that's a must. Um, Scotch bond universal from 3M is a fine product. Um, the new OptiBond universal from Kerr is also a good product. Definitely try uh, Clearfield universal from Curare and the new version of Clearfield Quick. Those are also interesting products. Um, those are the ones that I will, oh, and the one from Valco, which is called, I believe, Future Bond Universal. Those are, um, in my book, pretty solid products. 
Everything else is fine, but those usually get the highest bond strength every time I do some kind of testing. What are my thoughts on self-fetch technique with the sensitizing like Luma? It doesn't, it's, you don't need that. Um, self-fetch will not expose collagen. Gluma works on collagen, so um, it's a waste of material, but you will be doing culture a favor by using more product that they make, but you don't need to do that. Do you like Tokuyama Shield Force or use it? Never used it, I've tested it, it works fine. It's a fine Japanese product. You can use it, it's okay. Um, thank you for the conference. It was my, will using 2% chlorhexidine negatively affect bonding? Not in my lab, not in my lab. Um, I've read some papers that talk about how um, chlorhexidine hinders bond. Um, not in my testing, I haven't seen any of that. So I recommend it because I haven't seen a negative effect of using chlorhexidine on bond strength, okay? Another question here from Amir. He's using a fourth or sixth generation better um, in terms of post sensitivity. Well, fourth generation, fourth generation is a multi-step system where you etch, you prime, and then you bond. Something like um, all bond two from Bisco or um, Optiban, Optiban's uh, FL from from Kerr or Scotch by Multipurpose. Um, that will require etching to them. A sixth generation, it's a self-etch product. That will not require etching dentin with phosphoric acid. So from a post-op sensitivity point of view, sixth generation will generate none. However, from a bonding perspective, fourth generation is better. Sixth generation, their bonding was not even close to being par. So I would not recommend the use of a sixth generation. If there are shallow and deep areas of a prep, do you only line the deep areas? Yes, absolutely. Only the deep areas. You don't need to line the whole purple floor. You don't have to do that, especially when you have shallow areas. But do apply your liner before you do the bonding. So I got a protocol here saying protocol liner, shield force, that's an adhesive, I guess. Edge chlorhexidine universal bond composite or bioactive material composite. Uh, you place a liner um, and then you etch your um, you etch your enamel, you rinse that, apply your universal bonding agent on both enamel and dentin, and then place your composite. If you want to use chlorhexidine, you use chlorhexidine always after you etch and before you apply your adhesive, do not rinse it. Prime and bond, NT work with selective etch. No, it will not. Prime and bond is a fifth generation adhesive that requires etching on both enamel and dentist. Total etch system. Would you be doing incremental filling, reduce post up sensitivity? Yes, it will because there is a sensitivity related to the, the amount of stress that is generated by the polymerization shrinkage of the composite. But my post-op sensitivity webinar today was that post-op sensitivity that is related to bonding. But um, thank you for the input. Can I talk about the sequence of steps by adding a line to the adhesive steps? I already did. Let me go through them again. Apply your liner, etch enamel, rinse enamel, rinse with chlorhexidine, and then of course apply your bonding agent um, and then your composite. Uh, thank you for the webinar. Uh, my pleasure. I do select the veg in about five to six seconds to the dentin. Then use the micro prime, 20 seconds, then all bond, then composite. It works well. Do you think? Uh, what do you think? Of course, I use micro edge. Micro edge, I'm assuming, is yes. So that's your, um, that's your Sam Blaster. Um, I don't think you need to use microprime. I think that's an overkill. Um, I think that if you selectively etch the, the enamel, you don't need to etch the dentin. <clears throat> um, but if you etch the dentin and you feel comfortable using microprime, then go right ahead and then use your Alban. I think that's fine. Um, if you're using Alban Universal, you don't need to use microprime and you don't need to etch dentin with phosphoric acid. Um, using your aluminum oxide, uh, that's uh, 
uh, aluminum oxide is fine as your micro, that's fine as long as you rinse it well. It probably, it will have a better um, effect on enamel than on dentin for banding, but you know, you, that's okay. All right, so I'm done. I think, oh, one, another quite awesome webinar. My pleasure. Um, I am done with this presentation today. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for attending.